Hello, I'm doing a book review, and the book I want to review is Salem's Lot by Stephen King. Now, I did already review this book a couple of years ago. It was actually one of my first book reviews, and unlike a lot of my re-reviews where I take my old review down, since I actually kind of liked my old review of Salem's Lot, I decided to keep that up. However, it's no longer public, but I'll leave a link in the description to where you can see the old review on this book that I did. Now, I actually have two copies of Salem's Lot. I have this old paperback of Salem's Lot, but I also have the book in this collection right here. This is actually four of Stephen King's books that have been put together into one book, and those books are The Shining, Salem's Lot, Night Shift, and Carry. Now, this was published in 1975, and this was King's second novel, which he published right after Carrie. Now, according to the afterword of King's novella collection, Different Seasons, after the success of Carrie, there were two books that King was trying to get published. It was this book, which was originally going to be called Second Cummins, and then it was his book Blaze, which didn't get published till decades later. Now, Salem's Lot is basically Stephen King's version of Bram Stoker's Dracula. In fact, the whole idea came about when Stephen King was playing around with this idea that what if Dracula came back in modern times and his wife Tabitha made a joke that he would probably get hit by a bus or something. But that's essentially what Salem's Lot is. It's an updated, and by updated I mean 1975, which back then would have been modern version of Dracula. What's funny is Carrie, even though that wasn't a vampire novel, that was also sort of a tribute to Dracula because Carrie was written in very much the same style as Dracula. It was written in the form of diary entries and newspaper clippings and letters sent back and forth between different characters. Like, you could tell Dracula was a book that really had a huge influence on Stephen King, and you see the influence of Dracula in so many of his other books. The thing is, though, Salem's Lot is not just a vampire novel. It's also very much a haunted house novel. In fact, it kind of starts out as more of a haunted house novel, and you don't really find out that vampires are also at work in this story till kind of later on. But this is also very much a drama about small-town life. In a lot of ways, this book almost feels like a cross between Bram Stoker's Dracula, Shirley Jackson's the Haunting of Hill House and Peyton Place by Grace. You'll have to forgive me, I'm not really sure how to say that author's last name, but I'm pretty sure most people watching this video would probably be familiar with what book I'm talking about. But once again, this book really does feel like a cross between those three novels with some elements of Ray Bradbury's Something Wicked This Way Comes. Like Stephen King, he's an author who really does wear his influences on his sleeve leave, but he still manages to make it his own. This is also where so many of the tropes that Stephen King has become really well known for, and in some cases criticized for relying on these tropes a little too much. Like, this is where a lot of those tropes started. Like, a lot of his books deal with small-town life and sort of the ugliness that hides behind the facade of a seemingly peaceful community. Like, he's touched on that in novels like It, Under the Dome, and of course, his Castle Rock novels. You also have an author as the main character, another trope that he would become really well known for, but again, this is the book where a lot of those tropes started. I also think Stephen King is really good at writing coming-of-age stories, and this actually does have some elements of the coming-of-age genre, particularly with the Mark Petrie character. But Salem's Lot, I do think, is an excellent novel, and even though this was only his second book, even this early on in his career, he was writing really top-notch novels. 
And I think this is easily one of King's best books, and something he does really well here is he takes ordinary, everyday people and puts them in this impossible situation. Like, the main characters of this book are normal people who don't believe in the supernatural, and now they have to accept the supernatural in order to survive, and I think this is one of his best cast of characters in any book. Now, the plot of Salem's lot is it's about this author named Ben Mears who, when he was a little kid, lived for a couple of years in a small town in Maine called Jerusalem's Lot, or Salem's Lot as it's known to the locals, and in this town there's this house called the Marston House that is said to be haunted, and when Ben was a little kid, his friends dared him to go into the house, and the house was owned by a man named Herbert Marston who killed his wife and then and hung himself back in the 1930s, and when Ben went into this house, he saw, or at least thought he saw, the ghost of Herbert Marston. Now, as an adult, Ben doesn't know whether or not he actually saw this, or if this was just a child's overactive imagination, but he comes back to Salem's Lot to write a book about the Marston house, and he actually intends on renting the Marston house, but finds out that the house was already sold to a man named named Richard Straker. Now, what happens is a little boy named Ralphie Glick ends up disappearing, and his brother Danny ends up mysteriously dying. And throughout the novel, there's a series of mysterious deaths happening in Jerusalem's lot, and eventually it's revealed that this man, Richard Straker, is actually the human familiar of a vampire named Kurt Barlow, who has come to the town and is now trying to turn all the residents of the lot into to vampires. So Ben and a few other people find out what's actually going on, and now they have to stop Barlow. Now, in the book, you do find out that the Marston house is in fact haunted by some kind of a supernatural force of evil, and you get the idea that this evil force doesn't just possess the Marston house, but it also possesses the entire town of Jerusalem's lot, and you get the idea that the whole reason that Barlow came to Jerusalem's lot was because of whatever this evil force is. Like, you get the idea that Barlow is somehow attracted to this force and might even be drawing power from this force. Now, of course, the strength of this novel is definitely the characters, and it's the characters that really ground this story, because, of course, it's not a realistic story, but what King does here is he presents us with very believable characters who feel like real people, and you can almost imagine that this is how actual people would react to a situation like this. So, what King does with the character work here is he takes an unrealistic story and he makes it as reality-based as a story like this can possibly be. Now, while Ben is the protagonist of the novel, he's really the head of an ensemble cast of characters. And Ben's relationship with this girl named Susan Norton, that becomes almost like the heart of the book, and then his relationship with this boy named Mark Petrie, who becomes almost like a son to him, and really his relationship with those two characters, that is the heart of the story. Even though he doesn't actually meet Mark till very late in the story, and there is some tragedy that happens that I won't give away. But in the book, Ben and Mark Petrie and this high school teacher named Matt Burke and this doctor named Jimmy Cody and this priest named Father Donald Callahan, who is struggling with his faith, they all form sort of a basically a team of vampire hunters when they all figure out what's actually going on in the town. And I actually really liked the camaraderie between these characters, and you really are rooting for them to stop Barlow, and I don't want to give too much away about it, but let's just say Barlow pushes each of these characters to their limits, and Barlow really is one of King's most evil villains. And I don't want to give it away, but not all our heroes end up making it. And even by the end of the story, you can't really say for certain whether or not the main characters really won in the end, because, like... 
technically they won, but it's sort of like, at what cost? Because Barlow really does take everything from these people, so even though the good guys do kind of win in the end, it really isn't a triumphant ending, because these people are now so broken by what's happened. And that's where King portrays these characters very realistically, because it really does focus on what would be the psychological ramifications of facing down something like a vampire, something that you're told your whole life doesn't exist. And every character in this book, even some of the most minor characters, gets his or her own backstory explained, and there's so much rich characterization in this story. And Barlow really does make for a great villain. He's cunning and manipulative, and he doesn't just use his supernatural powers, but he also uses psychological warfare against the protagonist. And one thing that's really interesting about Barlow is there's a lot you don't know about him. Like, at one point it implies that he's thousands of years old. Like, for all you know, he might very well be one of the first vampires in existence. Like, at one point it implies that he's actually older than Christianity. Like, he might have actually have been there before the time of Christ, or at the very least he was there when the religion was first starting up. Like, at one point he says that he was old when Catholicism was young. It also implies at one point that Barlow has a master. Like, before Barlow is allowed to enter the town, Stryker has to make a sacrifice to not Barlow, but something else, and you're not really sure who or what Barlow's master actually is. You don't know if maybe it's some even more powerful vampire, or maybe it's the devil himself. Now, being that the majority of King's novels do take place in the same mythos, there's actually two fan theories on who Barlow's master actually is, but I'll talk about that when I talk about the connections between this and some of King's other books. Now, there is some definite social commentary in the book, like, the book is obviously a commentary on small-town life, but you could also look at the town of Jerusalem's lot as being almost like a microcosm society, and you see how easily this little society falls. There's also a lot of commentary in here about things that were going on politically and socially at the time this book was published. Like, there are references to the Vietnam War, Watergate, the gas crisis, and you actually see a lot of that commentary with the character of Father Callahan, where you could tell Callahan is somebody who's very troubled by the state of the world. Especially being a priest, he's troubled by not just the state of the world, but the state of religion in the modern world. And you could tell he definitely thinks about where is God's place in a world where society Society sort of has every reason not to believe in God. And with the Callahan character, I feel like King is sort of asking, what is religion's place in this modern world of science? And while being a man of the cloth, Callahan does very much question his faith. And he's also an alcoholic, and if you know anything about King's personal life at the time he wrote this book, you could tell he was putting a lot of himself into the Callahan character. And Father Callahan is definitely my favorite character in this book, and I think he's one of King's most compelling characters. And I think it's really interesting that when Callahan first finds out that vampires are at work in the lot, there's a part of him that's actually excited because he's now confronted with what he sees as proof of God's existence, because if supernatural beings like vampires exist, then and probably other supernatural creatures exist, and then why can't God exist as well? Especially when you see that crosses and holy water work against vampires, that's another indication that God exists. And by becoming a vampire hunter, Callahan feels like he can finally put his church to the test. Now, in the book you find out about this powerful force known as the White, 
which is implied to be the power of God, or at the very least, like, the ultimate force of good in the universe, and Callahan is actually able to channel the power of the White through his crucifix, which allows him the fight against Barlow and whatever is haunting the Marston house. But if you assume that the White is God, and if you assume that Barlow's master is Satan, when Callahan finally confronts Barlow, you get this real sense of this battle between God and Satan. So there is some definite commentary on religion in this book, and there are definitely some Christian overtones. But it's nothing that's preachy by any means, especially considering the fact that Callahan does have his doubts. And you also, and I don't want to give it away, but you also sort of see how Callahan's religion does sort of let him down. Now, as I pointed out before, this book is very much based on Bram Stoker's Dracula. Even though it does take inspiration from other literary works, it's clear that Dracula is sort of the main source of inspiration. Like, Ben could sort of be looked at as a stand-in for Jonathan Harker. Susan could be seen as a stand-in for Mina. You could look at Matt Burke as being sort of a stand-in for Van Helsing. In fact, at one point, Ben and Jimmy even compare him to Van Helsing. Straker is obviously a stand-in for Renfield, and Barlow is definitely Stephen King's version of Dracula. So, I don't think it would be unfair to call this sort of a pseudo-Dracula story, but as I pointed out already, Salem's Lot is an excellent book and is definitely one of King's best. Now, while this was only King's second novel, a lot of his later books would connect back to this one. The big one is the Dark Tower series, because the character of Father Callahan would go on to become a major character in the final final three Dark Tower books. Now, the Dark Tower series, for those of you unfamiliar with it, is a series of dark fantasy novels with elements of science fiction, horror, and even western. And the series is primarily set in an alternate universe known as Midworld, but the series deals with the concept of a multiverse. The whole idea of the series is that there are hundreds, thousands, perhaps even millions of different parallel universes, and each universe has its own version of planet Earth. And in the series, you find out that the multiverse is held together by this magical dark tower, which is essentially a manifestation of existence itself. And in the Dark Tower series, you find out about this being called Gan, who is implied to be God himself, and the Dark Tower is essentially the physical manifestation of Gan, or God. And once again, Gan and God could be one in the same. And the main villain of the Dark Tower series is this interdimensional demon called the Crimson King, who is implied to be Satan himself, even though that's never confirmed, and it's the Crimson King's ultimate goal to bring down the Dark Tower, which will destroy the multiverse. And the series follows a group of people known as the Ka-Tet who are trying to stop the Crimson King. And with the Dark Tower series, King bridges together all of his other books and short stories into the same multiverse. And because we're dealing with a multiverse here, even some of King's stories that are clearly not in the same universe can still be connected to each other. Like King's post-apocalyptic novel, novels like The Stand, The Mist, Cell, and even his dystopian novels like The Running Man and The Long Walk could still be connected to each other, once again, because we're dealing with the concept of parallel Earths. Each of those books could just be set on different parallel Earths, but they're all connected via the Dark Tower. 
Now, since Salem's Lot shares major links with the Dark Tower series, you could assume that Barlow's master was actually the Crimson King, or Barlow's master could have been Randall Flagg, who is another major villain from the Dark Tower. Now, Randall Flagg is this evil wizard who has the ability to travel in and out of different universes, and he's also the main villain of The Stand and The Eyes of the Dragon. And King does sort of use both Randall Flagg and the Crimson King to sort of represent the devil. And Dark Tower 5, Wolves of the Kala, really does read as sort of a sequel to Salem's Lot because it does explain what happened to Father Callahan after the events of this book, and it does explain how he eventually ended up in Midworld. And in Wolves of the Kala, you see Callahan join the Quartet, and if you read Salem's Lot along with the final three Dark Tower books, you really do see the character of Father Callahan go through a very interesting arc. Vampires also show up in the Dark Tower series, so that's another connection you got going on there, and the White also plays a major factor in that series, and Barlow is mentioned. Stephen King also wrote a book called Roadwork, which was originally published under his pen name, Richard Bachman, and in that book, I believe there's a character named Phil Drake, who is a priest. I'll admit I haven't read Roadwork yet, so I'm mainly going off stuff that I heard. But apparently Phil Drake is a very similar character to Father Callahan, and is even sort of described in the same way. So, if you want to tie Roadwork in with the Dark Tower continuity, you could say that maybe Roadwork is taking place after the events of Salem's Lot, but before Callahan ended up in Midworld. The only issue with that theory is I'm pretty sure Roadwork takes place in 1973, which would have been before the events of Salem's Lot. But maybe Phil Drake is actually a twinner of Father Callahan, and a twinner in the Stephen King mythos, I believe, is like an alternate universe version of the same person. Or maybe it's just a coincidence and Stephen King chose to write a similar character and hardcore nerds like me are taking it way too seriously. That is a possibility, too. Stephen King also wrote two short stories from his collection, Night Shift, which share direct links with Salem's Lot. One is a short story called Jerusalem's Lot, which acts as a prequel to Salem's Lot, set a hundred years before, and that story sort of explains what it is haunting the Marston House, as well as the entire town of Jerusalem's Lot. And then he did a short story called One for the Road, which acts as a direct sequel to Salem's Lot. Now, taking the continuity of the Jerusalem's Lot story into account, when you find out what's actually haunting the town of Jerusalem's Lot, it's not that far off from Pennywise from It, so there's a possible It connection going on. Also, even though this was published before The Shining, there's a possible Shining connection going on here. Like, before Ben finds out that there are vampires, when he's doing research into the Marston house, he talks about how he actually interviewed the sister-in-law of Herbert Marston, and she talks about that when Herbert murdered her sister, she knew it and she felt it, even though she was in a different part of the country at the time. So I saw that as a possible indication that she could have the shine. Jerusalem's Lot is also mentioned in several of King's other books, like The Dead Zone and Pet Cemetery, indicating that those books probably take place on the same version of Earth that this novel takes place on. However, tying this in with the Dark Tower mythos, since we're dealing with a multiverse here, we gotta also take into account that it's possible that different iterations of the same town could exist in different universes. 
Yeah, I know, even Stephen King would probably say I'm taking this way too seriously. I'm a nerd, that's what I do. Now, recently you had the Hulu series Castle Rock, which is supposed to take place in the Stephen King multiverse. I guess that depends on whether or not you count the show as canon, because it's not actually written by Stephen King himself. I actually do consider the show to be canon, however I don't consider it to be in exactly the same timeline as the mainstream Stephen King universe. But the reason I bring the show up is because Jerusalem's Lot actually made a brief appearance in the show. Now I want to cut to two short reviews on this book. The first one was done by my friend Christian Feliciano, and the other was done by author Mark Allen Gunnels. When it cuts back to me, I'm going to be talking about the film adaptations of Salem's Lot. My biggest problem with vampire books, or vampire movies, or vampire just stories in general, is that most of them are very repetitive. They like to touch on the same themes, the vampires tend to act the same, and the characters, you know, they, they tend to do the same things over and over again. Uh, the stories are also very similar. However, Salem's Lot is not one of those stories. Salem's Lot is fantastic. Yes, it is kind of a retelling of Dracula, but I feel like when Stephen King wrote that, I think he was being a little disingenuous because... Yeah, I get what he was talking about, I get what he means, and of course it was inspired by Dracula, but um, it, it's just so unique, because it's about a small, time, a small town, and it's about small town life, you know, and, 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 and the characters are great, they're very realistic, the vampires are creepy, uh, the story itself about this vampire who comes into the town and, and, and turning everybody into vampires, it's great, I, I love this story to death, uh, the writing style is amazing. Uh, Stephen King's prose is always good. I think, you know, he, he just, he really, um, he really can tell a story. Uh, you know, whether you like his books or whether you don't like his books, you gotta admit that his prose style is very good. I mean, it, he never messes up, he never skips a beat, he never gets too um, detailed. I know some people do criticize him for being a little too detailed. I don't, I don't think that's a problem really. Um, I think that uh, when he writes a story, he wants to pretty much um, put the image in your head so that you're seeing everything that he's seeing, and I and I think that works uh, very well. Uh, dialogue, Stephen King has a, a very good ear for dialogue. I think that he, um, it, I don't know if these characters talk in his head, I don't know if he takes what people say around him and he puts that into his stories. But either way, they sound like they're really talking. I, I enjoy that um, a lot. Uh, the characters are fantastic. Everybody is three-dimensional. Stephen King did a really good job with Salem's Lot. It was one of his first books that came out, I'm pretty sure. And um, yeah, it was just it's just so good to read. I've read it a few times. Love it to death. Um, I wish that they would remake the uh, movie. Now, I love the old movie. Just, uh, you know before anybody jumps on me, I love the old movie. But I, I would love to see a new one, um, especially with uh, today's uh, uh, graphics and stuff like that. I would love to see that. And um, yeah, I think that Salem's Lot will stick around forever. It's a great book. I recommend everybody read it. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hello, Mark Gunnels here. Uh, my friend Christian asked me to do a short review on the novel Salem's Lot by Stephen King. Uh, I was happy to do so. It is actually one of my favorite novels. Um, it's one of the earlier Stephen King books that I read. Um, I really got into King after he had uh, been pretty long into his career. Um, but I went back and read some of the early ones right after I discovered him. And Salem's Lot really blew me away. It's amazing to me when I read Carrie, which is his first novel, which is a novel that I like, but is very rough and raw. Um, and then Salem's Lot, which was his second book, to me, they're worlds apart in quality. Um, Carrie is decent. Salem's Lot, I think, is brilliant. It's a very creepy, atmospheric vampire novel. Um, and also a really wonderful exploration of a small town. Uh, the town of Salem's Lot really is a character in, in its own, own right. And I love the sections where he really um, explores the entire town and how what's going on with different characters, and that is, 
to me, the secret to Stephen King's success. Yes, it's a vampire novel, but his human characters are so real, are so complex and authentic, that it's easy to suspend your disbelief for the supernatural elements, because the town and the people feel so real. Um, I think it is a novel that is exciting, is emotionally um, involving, and ultimately is a satisfying novel. It's not a typical Hollywood happy ending sort of story, but I think the ending feels very appropriate and feels like the ending that that story should have. I'm a huge fan of Salem's Lot. I, I definitely think it is one of Stephen King's top tier books, and I highly recommend it. I hope you guys enjoyed Christian and Mark's short reviews on this book, and sorry about the dramatic change in lighting. I'm recording this part of the video at a different time. Now, this book was adapted into a made-for-TV miniseries in 1979. That miniseries was actually directed by Toby Hooper, who also directed stuff like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist. Now, it originally aired on television as a two-part miniseries, but it was later repackaged as a movie, and I think it was actually released theatrically in Europe. Now, I did review the movie a couple of years ago, and that review is still up, but to be honest, it's not one of my better reviews at all. Now, personally, I love the 1979 Salem Slot movie. It does change a lot from the book. Like, it leaves out a lot of characters from the book, and it also condenses a lot of stuff. I also love that movie's interpretation of Barlow. Now, it's not the Barlow from the book at all. In the book, Barlow looks and acts like a regular human, and he's also very intelligent, whereas in the movie, Barlow is pretty much just a monster. And for the movie, I actually think that works, because I kind of like how in the movie, Barlow is almost like this elemental force, like he's something that can't be reasoned with. Kind of like Michael Myers, in a way. And in the movie, he almost comes off like a wild animal let off Straker's leash, even though Straker calls him the master. In the movie, they sort of make Barlow look like a cross between Count Orlock from Nosferatu and Bela Lugosi's Dracula. I also really liked David Soul in that movie as Ben Mears, and I also really liked the kid who played Mark. Now, the character of Jimmy Cody is not in the movie. However, the movie sort of expands the role of Susan's father, and Susan's father in the movie takes on the role of Jimmy Cody. And Bill Norton in the film was played by Ed Flynn. Landers. Where the movie really did sort of drop the ball, in my opinion, was with Father Callahan, because Father Callahan is barely even a minor character in the movie. Now, granted, the movie was made in 1979, and this was decades before Stephen King would finish the Dark Tower series and incorporate Father Callahan into those novels, so obviously at the time they made this movie, they had no idea that Stephen Stephen King would later use that character again in some of his later books. But even so, Callahan was such an important character in the book, and he's barely in the movie. But besides that, I still really enjoy Toby Hooper's Salem Slot, and the movie also has some scenes that really have become indented in pop culture. Like, apparently the scene where Ralphie Glick is at his brother's window really traumatized a lot of kids in the late 70s and early 80s. Like, a lot of older people that I meet who were kids back when the movie came out told me that that scene really fucked them up. And the lighting changed again. Now, the 1979 film actually had a sequel in 1987 called A Return to Salem's Lot. Now, I should probably use sequel in quotes, because other than being about vampires and being set in a town called Salem's Lot, there's really no connections with the first one at all, or even the book for that matter. Now, I can't necessarily say that A Return to Salem's Lot is a good movie. It's an interesting movie, but it's a Larry Cohen film, so good or bad, you're always going to get something interesting from that guy. And the movie does suffer from 
some bad acting, with the exception of Michael Mortiardi and Samuel Fuller, both of whom are great in the movie. And the kid playing the main character's son was honestly a pretty horrendous actor. But my biggest problem with the movie is it suffered from what I can only call doesn't know what it wants to be syndrome. The movie didn't know whether it wanted the vampires to be sympathetic or outright evil. There's a character in the movie who starts off as evil, but there's a moment where you think he's going to have some kind of redemption and the movie doesn't do anything with it. There's a vampire who you find out was actually a Nazi during World War II, and they do nothing with that character. In the movie, it seems like the main character's son is going to be on the vampire's side, and then he isn't. Once again, the movie really didn't know what it wanted to be. But the positive is you had Michael Mortiardi as the main character, and you had Samuel Fuller, who kind of stole the movie as a Nazi hunter who becomes a vampire hunter. The movie also has a very young Tara Reid. She was only a kid in the movie, so that's kind of interesting, I guess. This book was adapted again into a 2004 miniseries on TNT. I've never seen it, but I've heard both good and bad about the 2004 adaptation of Salem's Lot. I know in the movie Rob Lowe played Ben Mears and Donald Sutherland played Straker. And I know in the 2004 movie, Barlow is a lot closer to how he was in the book and he's played by Wrecker Hauer. And James Cromwell played Father Callahan in the 2004 movie. But from what I've heard, apparently that movie made him a villain. So it sounds like neither film adaptation got Callahan right. Now, if they ever do another film adaptation of Salem Slot, I personally think Mads Mikkelsen would be a fantastic Kurt Barlow. So, that was my review on Salem's Lot by Stephen King, and long days and pleasant nights to you.